Owen. I love Jeff's name, Sakamoto. <laughs> Sakamoto, actually. Sakamoto. Yeah. Sakamata. I mean, I'm, I have I've a weird last worse. name too. Craft chick. Uh, <laughs> you can imagine crafty chick, craft macaroni and cheese. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure you had people butcher your last name too. So. Of course, of course, yeah. So happy to have Jeff on. Um, I found Jeff through a mutual connection. Some people may know uh, Brad Lee. I hit up Jeff. I was like, yo, Jeff, you look cool. I see the cars, the clothes, uh -huh. the mission, the real estate. I was like, let's talk to Jeff today. So happy to have Jeff on the Unconventional Money Moves podcast. And um, Jeff, you is your main thing real estate? Is it bodybuilding? Like uh -huh. what? Is it everything? Tell me. It's tell, a great tell, question. Tell everyone what's happening. It's a great question. I get that a lot because I, I don't I don't post professionally a lot on Instagram. And, you know, that's obviously how most folks kind of see the updates in my life. But, yeah, I'm a full-time real estate developer. Um, that's what I do for a living. Um, on the side is kind of my hobbies. Yeah, I'm a professional uh, bodybuilder. I'm in the – I compete in the WBFF. And uh, I'm also a model with Ford Models. And so a lot of times, just because it's Instagram, that's the stuff that gets posted. But not my full-time gig. They're they're my creative outlets and uh, just a good time. It's, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like it's like good to have those sort of more creative outlets? Because uh, everything nowadays, like I feel like a lot of people are jumping into real estate because they want to get rich. However, when it comes to not getting into real estate, but building a real estate business, I feel like that's where a lot of people fall short and don't fully understand exactly what goes into it. 100%. Uh, to answer your question, yes, it's absolutely imperative for me to have those creative outlets because, you know, it's a grind. I mean, if you, to your point, if you really want to build a business in real estate, you got it, you got to grind. And um, so having those those stress outlets, whether it's the gym or what have you, is is, is always healthy for me anyways, so... Yeah. And now like has have have these passions that you have like the bodybuilding and the modeling are those like incentivized at all or are they just like you know you do it for the mental the mental grind. Well, let's put it this way. I'm not getting rich off of it, but uh you know there's certainly perks. You know, yes, I do get paid um for different commercials that I've been on, different print ads, things like that. And then the competing aspect um, you know, we don't we don't win prize money or anything like they do at the Olympia. But, um, you know, look, it's for me, it's very rewarding uh, to, you know, meet be around like minded people, similar interests. I meet people from all over the world through that. It's to me, that's really rewarding, not financially, but in other ways. And that's like super interesting because I talk to like a lot of different people and everyone's like, yo, I want to get to the top. But it's like, yo. I like talk to certain people about their finances. I was like, what can you do to like make an extra just $20 a day? Like nothing crazy, just 20 bucks a day. If you can make an extra 20 bucks a day. That's about $7,300 a year. Yep. So I find that very intriguing that you have your main business is real estate. That's, that's the big money maker. It seems like yep. to me. And then you have these creative outlets such as, you know, dressing in nice clothes, taking nice pictures, which real estate's all about taking the nice pictures, <laughs> yeah. setting the scene. However, these creative outlets, even though they don't, like you said, you're not getting rich off of them, they do produce a little bit of income. And I'm sure you could talk about how those creative outlets have opened up more doors for you. 100%. I'm a huge side hustle guy. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of people building their business through side hustles. And you know, to me, you have to create that margin. You have to create that extra income in your life that isn't going to support your bills if you want to get ahead. And a lot of folks, you know, they, they work in nine to five and they're content with that and that's fine. But unless you have something that gets you out of that, it's going to be really hard to create that margin in your life to do, ever be able to do that, right? And so um, for me, again, um, fortunately, my, my real estate is at the point where, um, you know, I would consider myself financially free and, and this is just extra. But it wasn't always that way. And, you know, I, I used to grind. I used to, I worked multiple jobs um, and we're happy to talk about that um, later. But um, I'm a big proponent of, of for young people to to start a side hustle, to create that margin, whatever it is, not only just to build your skill set, but also to create that that income margin in your life. So what was like your beginning spark into into your mind? You're like, listen, real estate, real, I'm going all in on real estate. Was there like 
you know, what sort of event happened that caused that caused that spark? Yeah, so you kind of have to go back. So I'm I'm older than you, obviously. And Let, let's hop I, in the DeLorean. Let's go back in time <laughs> going, a little bit. We're going back in time, and it's that's my generation. So I'm happy to do that. But uh, yeah, so I graduated college in 1999. Um, I I played baseball in college. I played two sports in college, but baseball was my main sport. I played at Oregon State University, and I thought I was going to be a pro professional baseball player. I did, and I got injured my senior year, um, and kind of had to figure out what I wanted to do. And fortunately, I had been a good student. Um, obviously, having you know uh, sports on your resume is is good for employers, and I was able to land a really good consulting job. You, you know, it's like at the time it was you either go investment banking or you go consulting. Like those are the two really cool jobs. What I found about two months into consulting is I hated it. I absolutely hated it. And I mean, I, I was on the road 100% of the time, working 90 hours a week, you know, it, it was really hard. And I, I just didn't find it rewarding. At that same time, I was handed a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And um, that kind of got my mind thinking, right? And so ended up making a pivot about a year later into my career where I got into the investment world and kind of, you know, doing traditional wealth management, uh, similar, I think, to what you're doing. Um, but, um, I was really captivated by real estate and, you know, this is going into, you know, 2005, 2006, when the, the market was really heating up. And, um, so we ended up launching a fund to invest in real estate and, um, was, was going awesome. It was going amazing until about 2008 and then 2008 hit. And when you were, you know, essentially financing development for other folks that were getting killed in the market you know, it, it was hard. And so long story short, I spent about five years going after collecting on our investment. And that was redevelopment of assets. That was, you know, pursuing folks that uh, we were essentially the bank, right? And so I, I was, imagine you like going around with like, I'm sure you didn't do this, but I could imagine you going around with the baseball back the thug, like, the thug yeah, I'm, here, I'm here to collect. <laughs> right. Yeah. The repo man. Um, it never got to that. But, um, you know, through that process, I mean, that was a, that was the hardest time of my life. Candidly, you know, I went from, you know, being a broke uh, college student with a young family to being a millionaire in a very short period of time, you know, through that process. And then I lost it all. I lost it all in that process. Uh, millions of dollars. And so going from you know, being on top of the world to basically starting over was really, really hard and very humbling. But through that process, I learned a lot about real estate. I went back to school and formalized my education. I got my master's in real estate, but I, I found I really loved the hands-on piece of multifamily investing and that's developing apartment buildings. And so that's what I've done now for uh, shoots about uh, 12, 13 years and um, love it. I love what I do every day. So you basically had to start from zero twice. You had two huge losses. And I feel like this is really important, especially like for anyone. Like first, like when you're a kid, you have dreams of becoming an athlete. And then there's people like Jeff who actually could realize that dream of being an athlete. And it was basically like taken from you. So like to what would you say to like all of the athletes out there? Because obviously what is it 99 percent of them are going to go pro in something else yeah yeah you know i have two boys that are uh we're both division one athletes in fact my younger one is a, a senior right now and, and we've had these conversations and I, I had the opportunity to coach a lot of kids uh coming through that were similar ages and i always tell them use sports to get an education to learn life lessons to learn perseverance just exactly the things that i had to learn and that's going to be kind of a key for you as you move on. You know, so many athletes um, just rely on their physical talent and, you know, kind of coast through it. And then when they're done playing, it's really, it's a hard adjustment. And, you know, if you can use it to one, get a great education, but two, learn the lessons that you need to be successful in business or in relationships or anything else, that's the key. And so that's what I love sports for, to be honest with you. Yeah. Like, it's great to get into sports for the camaraderie. You know, you learn life lessons. You learn a lot about who you are as a person. And yep. what's what's crazy to me is I, looking backwards, the people who had like the most potential, but like didn't 
recognize how much potential they had. Ultimately, from like my school, like they didn't make it to the next level, but there was like that kid who was like almost there who just kept grinding, kept grinding, yep. kept grinding. Overachieving and yep, totally. They they ended up beating anyone. So how did that loss of baseball help you through the loss of the worst financial crisis most likely that we'll ever see in our lifetime in 2008? Yeah, no, hopefully, hopefully it's the worst, you know, I mean, we're in kind of weird times right now, but, you know, I think, I think it's this, it's, so when I, when I was in college, um, after my freshman year, we found out that my girlfriend at the time was pregnant. And so I married her that summer. We had a son, I was 19 years old. And so we went through, I had a little different college experience playing two sports and having a family. Um, when I graduated, um, I realized there's no more scholarship. There's no more, you know, apartment to live in. It's like, I got to figure this out. I don't have a choice. My back's against the wall and I got to, I got to make it happen. And so when I found myself in 2008 and having to go through that, it was almost the same feeling. It's like, I don't have a choice. Like I've got a family support. I, you know, I can sit here and feel sorry for myself and blame the economy and everything else. But the reality is that's not going to help anything. And so you just battle and you fight your way out of the corner and figure it out. I mean, that's, Candidly, that's it, right? It's just trying to be resourceful. I'm a big Tony Robbins fan. I've, um, I consider him a mentor, and he says, you know, the key to to success is being resourceful. And I think it's that. I think it's just being resourceful. So during 2008, what did you do to like grind that out? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> you, you kind of <laughs> joke around. You kind of joke around about the being the repo man, but I mean, literally, I you you just get really creative. You figure out ways to incentivize people to to work with you versus other people, right? And to get you and your investors paid, you know, before them. And so again, it's that it's that resourcefulness, it's that creativity, and finding ways to um, to work with people. And you really learn a lot about relationships. You really learn a lot about human nature and people's motivations and um, so that was a, that was an MBA in in relationships and dealing with people for sure. So you had to you had to figure out a new pie. Have you ever heard about the pie? I'd love to hear about it. So the pie is essentially like all right, let's just say Jeff has two of two baseballs and I have one baseball. Jeff is twice as much in baseball as I am. But what a lot of people don't realize is Rather than saying like, all right, Jeff should get twice as much as Josh because he has two two baseballs versus his one, they look at the pie. So if the pie is five, if Jeff and Josh can get five baseballs together, that means you can get an extra half baseball if you work with Josh, and then I can you know get a larger baseball. So, so we split up that pie. You would get yep. the certain dynamic of the baseball and. It seems like that's what you did is you're like, listen, I have this opportunity. You're not going to get it from anyone else. So you have to work with me and figure out what this split looks like so that, you know, if I don't win, this isn't happening. But right. if you help me win, then you're going to and also win. Exactly. You nailed it. Right. It's, it's about creating those win win relationships. Right. And so uh, I feel like that's that's a key to success in anything, whether it's sales or uh, doing, you know, million, hundred million dollar real estate deals. It's trying to find win win relationships. Yeah. That's, that's the tough part. A lot of people struggle with that. They're just like, how do I, how do I benefit rather than how do we benefit? And I feel like a lot of people fall short of that. So 2008 happens, you're literally being creative. Like what was that creative idea that like got you from being in a slump? Like you're like yeah. on a 10 game you know, hit list streak to, oh, to, get, hot. Yeah. <laughs> to, get, yeah. to get hot. Yeah. Yeah. So what it was really was we, uh, we had to, it was the, one of the deals that we had was in Portland, Oregon, and it was supposed to be a ground up condo condo project that was completely failed. Like the, the condo market, the bottom dropped out completely. And so we had this land that we ended up taking back and ended up owning. And we had to figure out um, what to do with this land. And, Long story short, um, I cold called an apartment developer over in Seattle, who was one of the most prolific apartment developers, and said, "Look, I've got this land. Um, I'd love to love to work with you on it." And it's you know again, it's being creative and trying to figure out a win-win relationship for them. 
And um, long story short, he wasn't interested in land, but he said, I like you. I, I like what you're doing. I'd love to work with you on other deals. And so we ended up figuring out another, another way to reposition that asset. But what that did is that got me into the game of development. Um, I went out and I found a couple um, properties in Portland that were great apartment sites. We partnered on them and um, he was essentially backing me uh, from an investment standpoint, mentoring me, teaching me the ropes. And that was really the genesis of my um, apartment and multifamily career. So like you, you own the land, like how did you, how, how do you find land? Like, it's just like, I'm going to buy this land. Like, during 2008, how did, how did you scrap all that together? Well, so the two pieces. So the one, the one piece of land that I originally called him on was land that we had invested in and we, we ended up taking back from the, from the developer that failed on the condo. But as far as the, the new projects, man, I got gritty. I started going door to door in, in pockets of town that I wanted to be in and saying, look, um, I'd love to buy your property. You know, we're willing to do X, Y, and Z. And um, anyways, it, Timing worked. I uh, found a couple of really good sites, A locations in really cool parts of town. And um, yeah, just ended up working out. Now, do you still own these today? What's the, so you get in, you develop it. What's like your strategy there is to eventually sell it out, just keep it. Yeah. So we actually sold these last year. Um, but shoot, that's, you know, almost a, almost a 10 year hold. I mean, this was back in 2012 that we started. So, you know, had the cash flows coming in, you know, on a, on a regular basis, ended up being fantastic projects. We, we had a hundred percent occupancy most of the time with waiting lists, just because it was in such cool parts of town. Unfortunately, my, my partner, um, passed shortly after we, uh, we did our second deal. He had really advanced liver cancer and was gone before you know it. So I ended up becoming partners with his family and his, his widow, um, and so I was kind of the, the quarterback, if you will, of the deal. And, um, you know, they were, they were just looking for cash flow and everything else. I said, I'm fine with that, you know? So we ended up holding the assets for a long time. And then we felt it was the right opportunity to sell kind of at the peak of the market. And that's what we did. So yeah, it was, every deal is different. That one was, you know, what it was. Mm -hmm. And when you're selling like these apartment complexes and then you end up selling them after a 10 year hold like that. Is it like super complicated to figure all of that out with like the depreciation and everything and adding all of that back in, in terms of figuring out what that buyout's going to look like? Um, or is it as easy as like, I see all these uh, ads for Grant Cardone saying like how simple it is. Cause I, I don't feel like it's not that simple. It's not that simple. You, you, I mean, personally, um, you know, with talking about depreciation and everything else, I mean, those are the one of the amazing benefits of, of investing in real estate, but that's why I've got a great tax guy is because you know, even I, even though I've been in the business a long time, I don't pretend to know all the recapture of, de of depreciation and everything else. So, uh, yes, there's a that's a, certainly a, a component of it is kind of figuring that out the economics and the tax ramifications of selling at different times. But um, do I think that do I think that investing in real estate and multifamily is rocket science? Absolutely not. It's not also as easy as maybe Grant portrays it to be. You know, so I think I think there's a meeting in the middle. He's like, just pick up the phone. What are you doing? Yeah. Let's, Let's make deals. some deals. <laughs> is, that, is that simple? A lot of people don't realize, I mean, um, when you're successful in the game, whether your game's baseball or real estate or investing, uh, to stay in the game for longer than 10 years is phenomenal. So like being that you've been able to stick out 2008, I'm sure being able to just survive that increased uh, – what's called like your white space. So like yeah. now you have all these opportunities cause like everyone, you know, all these people quit. You're like, I'm not quitting. Yep. Uh, so, so what turned into a terrible event ended up, you know, you got the, you reap what you sowed. If that's the right phrase, I don't know. Uh, absolutely. Uh, with, this, with, with this deal here and good yep. timing on selling cause uh, interest rates suck right now. So having cash is uh cash is King right now. Absolutely. It was fortuitous, but, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a good time to sell for sure. For sure. So now that you have some extra shekels in the pot, what's your next move with interest rates being higher? Cause obviously that affects real estate. Uh, however, what a lot of people don't understand is when you're a developer such as yourself, if your interest rates higher, you actually have more to write off. So you could get creative and figuring out, you know, I have a higher rate that gives me more to depreciate, more to write off 
from a tax standpoint. Sure. So like, where are you thinking is like your next move? Well, I'll tell you. So we, uh, we're an active developer. We have several projects that are in our pipeline. Um, I will tell you that we're not going to probably break ground on any of those until 2024, until things settle down from an interest rate perspective. Um, I think that, you know, investors, our investors have had just a great run, just a great run over the last, you know, several years, right? And so expectations are, are sky high. And then, but to your point, interest rates really affect, affect returns in multifamily. It, it just magnified with leverage, right? And so I think there's a kind of a realization right now that some of the returns that have been, you know, achieved over the last several years may not be as achievable over the next several that said, there will also be an amazing amount of opportunities for guys uh, that didn't really know what they're doing and got into things like bridge loans and didn't buy a buy a you know a, a cap you know rate cap things like that that are going to find themselves in trouble you know or already are and just hasn't kind of come to the to the top yet. But some of those guys that got in the business that hadn't experienced two thousand eight and everybody's a everybody's a billionaire multi-family investor now and I'm not going to name names but. <laughs> Uh, it's gonna get interesting, you know. Yeah, and I mean, recently we just had the Silicon Valley Bank fail because they started buying these long-term treasuries. Yep. And as interest rates go up, what people don't understand is bond prices decrease and they decrease yep. and they decrease because of the interest rate. The higher the interest rate, the smaller your value is going to be. And if you get over leveraged, uh, someone's got to get paid, and the money has to come from somewhere. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you're going to have to end up filing bankruptcy, or I don't, I don't know. Bankruptcy is pretty bad. I don't, I don't, I don't think just, there's anything worse yeah, in business than bankruptcy. No, right? Yeah. No. It's what's what's so interesting about that though is if you look at their strategy, it was actually fairly conservative, right? They weren't getting over leveraged and you know crazy asset classes or things like that. They just got caught in the wrong buying the wrong assets at the wrong time, you know. And it's really easy to do in a, in a very fluctuating market like this. Yeah, and it's it's strange to me because everyone tries to put things into a box, but what they don't realize is everything in this box doesn't pay attention to anything that's outside the box. Yep. So being that we're in a rising interest rate environment, things that are safe actually are riskier because if interest rates are going up, that's going to negatively affect those assets. And you're yep. seeing things that people consider risky are actually where you want to put your money. Is there something like that within real estate that you need to make sure you're sticking with the times and not just becoming a uh, a knuckleball pitcher? Yeah, well, I think you know there's a couple things. One, the interest rate perspective. I think you know when you're when you're in an inflationary environment like we are, I love multifamily. I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, um, in an inflationary environment, you have the ability to increase rents, things like that, which is a hedge against inflation. Mm -hmm. That said, um, I think we're in a really changing period of time in real estate where, you know, asset classes like retail, like shopping malls, like office, it's changing. Like those used to be the sexy investments. And now as, as trends change, things are happening post COVID, you know, people aren't going to the office. Is office a good place to invest? Um, you know, Amazon, you know, is taking over the world and you don't necessarily need to go shopping anymore. It's really changing. And so you just have to keep up with what's going on out there if you want to be a professional investor, right? I mean, you have to, you have to, you have to skate, skate to where the puck's going to be, not where it's at. So like, what's your next, do you have like any like cool ideas that are brewing that you're able to share? Sure. Well, I love, I love development. I think, again, I think if real estate is very, it's local, right? It's, it's local. And so the market in Detroit versus the mar market here in Scottsdale is very different, but I love, I mean, you, you hear it probably all the time, but I love some of these markets that are uh, where the jobs are going, you know, um, Phoenix, I love Austin, um, Florida, some of the Florida markets are still really good. Nashville, Charlotte, some of those markets, um, I love the idea of going ground up development and just not breaking ground until things settle down a little bit. I mean, that's personally our strategy. And um, I think I think when things come to normalization, we're going to be really well positioned. Mm. And what does normalization like look like in your world? Do you have like a target interest rate you're hoping things or just seeing like kind of just like letting the dust settle a little bit? 
It's letting the dust settle. I mean, right now, uh, one thing, one measurement that we use in, in real estate is called cap rate. And basically, you know, cap rates have increased from, you know, three and a half percent in some markets to six. And what that does to valuations is insane. It's, it's been so across the board. And so transactions today, people don't know what the cap rate is. And there's a huge gap in the bid ask spread between buyers and sellers. And so in a, in a really crazy time, it's hard to pin down. You kind of need to know where it's going to settle out at. And until I think until, you know, rates settle down a little bit, it's going to be really hard for the, for the cap rates to settle a little bit too. And for anyone that doesn't know, a cap rate is like the max interest rate that you get, or is that something different? Cap rate, uh, simplest way is if basically you cash, you paid cash for a property, it's the return that you expect on the asset. So if you paid mm -hmm. cash for a multifamily building and uh, no debt, anything else, and you see, and you bought it at a five cap, you would get 5% on your money of 100% investment, if that makes Got sense. Got it. Yeah. And when you're looking at a deal, are you more worried about what's more important to you, like the cap rate or like the amount of cash coming through? Or is it like... <laughs> It, it no, depends. It's a good it, I think it's all of the above, right? I think so. The valuation is dependent on both. It's both cap rate and your net operating income or NOI, and so both factors go in to create a value um, evaluation in our business. And so both are really important. We have to look at rents, we have to look at operating expenses, and then we have to look at cap rate to ultimately see what somebody will pay for an asset in a given market. And it's different, like I said, in Phoenix versus Nashville versus New York versus San Francisco. They're all different. And so it's so nuanced. And that's why, you know, personally, I love the Sunbelt markets. I think that um, that's where people are going. I think that's where investors want to invest and your cap rates are going to be lower as a result, which is a good thing for investors, for, for developers like myself. Yeah. And with like all this commercial real estate. So like one thing myself, and I'm not sure I feel like a lot of people struggle with is when you get out of school, you're in this like oasis, like everything is pretty much given to you. You're in school, you have yeah. all your friends, everything is set up for you, where you live, where you study, where you go to class. Is Do you know of like any developments going on that could target or is targeting like younger, younger people to have some sort of like shared, like, I just imagine like a big building, it's all like young professionals and they have like a big room where they all work and it's create some sort of community, especially now that we're in more of a virtual kind of world. Yeah. So it's funny you say that because my first two projects in, in Portland, the ones I mentioned with the partner were actually similar to that. What we did is we found really good locations where young people want to live, but it's super expensive. And so what we did is we built smaller studio units and then what we did, and didn't have a lot of amenities, but on each floor you had both uh, big kitchens and you had like a co-working area. And so that was really, I mentioned the hundred percent occupancy in the waiting list because it was much more affordable for them to have just a smaller unit, go use the kitchen when they need to, go use the amenities when they need to. But I would say generally, um, there's not a ton of that other than like your traditional student housing. It's hard and that's why it's hard for folks today, you know, that are that are graduating college and going and getting their first job. I mean, it's expensive. It's expensive to live out there. I mean, you know how it is. It's, you know, and I, I've, got, I've got sons and everything else. And um, so I hear about it, I get it, you know? It's uh, it's why you, it's why you why you get roommates, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, what do you get? Four or five people living in a place. Rents like right. four or five hundred bucks. You're paying like two, three grand yeah. all together, but you're just scrapping and uh, yeah. sharing sharing everything, which people seem to get away from over time. However, like as people get older, uh, maybe people lose like a loved one, they end up finding themselves alone and almost need to like get back into like, there's like, I feel like there's nothing that replaces like a, like it's, it's like, oh, throw them in the nursing home. There needs to be yeah. something, there needs to be something before a nursing home, I feel like. Well, there is. And that's, that's another kind of like a branch off the whole multifamily world is they're doing this kind of active adult. So like 55 plus where they're not ready to be, they don't need the full spectrum of care that, you know, a, a traditional nursing home would provide. But it's like, you know, 55 year old seniors that want to still be active and have some community are around the similar, similar people. Right. And so they do a lot of community events. There's several here in Phoenix that are, are going up. It's actually a growing segment of the population as the as the demographics, the baby boomers kind of get to that point. So. Yeah, there's a huge one in Florida, the villages, and it just keeps growing and growing and I growing. <laughs> I, I, uh, 
I I I I don't know if this is a hundred percent true, but I f- remember reading something. It was like the highest rate of like STDs in the country is in this retirement community. I guess it's like everyone's going back to college and just doing whatever they want to do. <laughs> You're, they're not making that up. It's 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 a thing. It's it's crazy. These 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 uh, grandma and grandpas are uh, getting after it. It's uh, it's it is. I, I've heard that statistic several times. Okay, you haven't witnessed anything, have you? I no, no, I haven't. <laughs> uh, fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, not witnessing anything. Yeah. So cool. So you're working. You're basically like letting the dust settle. Anything like just chilling right now. So like while you're chilling, like what are you doing to like get ready for your next next at bat when it comes to your deals? Yeah, so I'm actually not chilling. I, and I'm sorry if I made it seem, seem that way. So what I'm doing right now is I'm going out and I'm trying to negotiate deals and, and signing up deals, land deals that we can close on next year. So we're not going to close right away, but we're going to get it under contract. We're going to start the design process the entitlement process, which which can take anywhere from 12 to 18 months. And so when the dust does settle in 2024, 2025, we're ready to go. We're coming out of the ground hot and ready to strike. Whereas if we wait till next year and things settle, then you got to wait the 12 to 18 months to get it, you know, entitled and ready to go, get your permits. And at that point, you know, we're going to be a couple steps ahead of you. And so we're not the only ones doing it. There's other groups doing it as well, but a lot of folks candidly are on the sidelines right now. They're just kind of like shell shocked a little bit. And um, I don't think that's the best strategy. I think there's opportunities in every market. Yeah. And I find that I meet a lot of people that are just like, they're go, 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 go. Like you got to make sales calls. You got to make sales calls. You got to make sales calls. Cause uh, we could all agree. Like you need sales in order to be successful, but what, some people are missing is what you're doing right now. Like you're ready to go. However, you got to put all the building blocks in place in order to make sure you know exactly what you're going to do so that you don't have to sacrifice quality in order to get the returns that you're seeking. Yep. Look, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of working hard, but you gotta, you gotta work smart too. Right. And so try to do both, you know, and it's just kind of finding that balance that, that you mentioned. Yeah. That's awesome. So with all of your deals, like what else is going on that's exciting in your life with your kids or anything that's happening? Yeah. So I'm actually uh, currently eight weeks out from my next show. Uh, my next bodybuilding competition that will, yeah, <laughs> a little flex. Yeah, on. you're ready. Uh, I'm getting there. So right now is when it starts getting hard. You're doing, you know, two or three workouts a day. You're doing cardio twice a day and, and diet is very regimented. So, you know, I actually like it because it adds a lot of structure to my life. I get up about 4.30 in the morning and I start my day then. And, um, you know, just until I go to bed, everything, you know, is structured, my meals, my workouts, my work. And to me, I'm really productive during that time. But that's that's what it's like consuming the more more of my day. But look, I'm I'm so blessed. I um I have two boys that are uh, 26 and 22. Um, as I mentioned, my younger son is um, playing college baseball and will finish this year. And then my older son um, played college baseball and then uh, founded a company in the in the crypto world, um, and uh, just been really successful. And um, so always love getting together with them and, you know, more than, more than any success or anything, they're just quality human beings and I love spending time with them. So I, I do it any chance I get. So when you started um, working on your physique, obviously you were an athlete, still an athlete. How has your diet changed from like when you were a college athlete to now? Yeah. Well, you know, you think you think you know what you're doing, right? When you're a college athlete, you're eating everything you can and working out and everything. But but when you get out of college and you're still eating everything that you can and your metabolism slows down, it's not a good recipe. You know, you you don't have the same the same metabolism. So what I found personally is that I actually got really out of shape um, during parts of my life. Um, and you know, when I was about to turn forty uh, about six years ago, um, I found myself out of shape, and I said, I've got two choices. I can either continue doing what I'm doing, let myself go and just be fat and happy, or I can make a change. And 
Fortunately, I chose the latter, and honestly, it was one of the best moves I've ever made. My confidence increased, my productive productivity increased. I just have a different outlook on the world. My mindset's changed everything else. And so I'm a huge proponent of physical fitness, um, discipline, all of those things, just not because just to do it, but the impact that it has on all areas of your life. It has that ripple effect throughout your entire life. And uh, so look, I've, I've obviously been an athlete, but I've also been in great shape and I've been in, on the other side of the spectrum. And I'll tell you, it's way better being in shape, even, even through all the hard work and diet and everything else. Yeah. You got to put in the, put in those reps. So like yeah. when you're preparing for like a show, cause I would say most of us are never going to do what you're about to do in the next several weeks. Like how intense is it? Like, are you eating like 500 calories a day, 2000, a thousand, like what sort of, I'm sure every person's a little bit different. What sort of, uh, planning and like calculations go into that? Yeah. I've got a great coach who basically tells me exactly what I need to eat, when I need to eat it. Um, but right now I'm eating six times a day. Uh, my calories are in the low two thousands. Um, whereas, you know, when we started this prep, you know, 10 weeks ago, um, there were, you know, probably 3,500. So you're gradually working your way down and gradually getting leaner. Um, but yeah, it's, it's chicken breast, it's rice, you know, it's some lean ground beef, it's oatmeal, it's egg whites. And it's not much more than that. It's not sexy, you know, but it's, after a while, you kind of get used to it, you know, but it's, it, yeah, I mean, you, um, you want to know exactly, you want to measure exactly what you're taking in, you know, what gets measured gets results. And it's the same thing in fitness as it is in business or anything else. And, and so, um, yeah, just very regimented. You just, you just know exactly what you're supposed to do and when you're supposed to do it. Gotcha. And like for anyone out there, like what sort of, um, supplements do you take regularly to like, keep you looking as good as you do as you've, you know, progressed in your life. No, I appreciate that. Um, you know, one thing that I found uh, is that um, I'm not invincible anymore. <laughs> I'm not invincible anymore. And so my joints start hurting, you know, you, when you wake up, you're like, oh, so things like that. So, so things like fish oils that I never took before and things like vitamins and things like, um, you know, stuff to protect your organs and your heart, things like that. Um, are, are really what I take from a supplement standpoint. I do, I do take, you know, protein powder, creatine, things like that to help with the, the muscle side. But what I've really found is, you know, staying healthy is half the battle, feeling good. And there's a lot in today's supplement world that can help you in that. Is there any supplements people should stay away from? Ooh, good question. Um, I remember back in college, uh, the big thing was uh, Jack 3D. Do you remember the Jack 3D? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I would There's take the, the Jack. I would take that Jack 3D, <laughs> and I would be tingling. It would be like ah. Yeah, there's some of that stuff uh, that uh, you know you just got to be careful with. You know, some of those, some of the stimulants. Um, you know, you can get your heart rate up to the point where it's not healthy, and you know. A lot of us gym bros, we uh, we think that more is better, <laughs> and it's not. So you just have to be careful, right? And just you know, um, start small and kind of work your way up. But yeah, I, I would say stimulants are are one area that you just got to be careful on. Yeah, I just like doing coffee. Just I love coffee, coffee too, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm straight the black way. coffee. That's right. Nature, nature's pre workout. Yeah. Yeah, I heard some people even talking about like. Uh, this mud water. It's like a coffee replacement because I guess some people are coming out with studies nowadays that like coffee doesn't really energize you. It just blocks certain things in your brain that makes you feel like you're gaining energy. So like there's some okay. things coming out like again. What is mud coffee. water exactly? Yeah. What, so what is the mud I, water? I don't even know. I just, <laughs> I, I met someone no, the other day. I met someone the other day uh, who is a computer engineer and he started doing a lot of research into, you know, when you're programming, you're focused, you yeah. gotta be focused and, but you don't want to be jittery. So he started doing like a lot of research into, he, he said mud water was like something he tailored this after, but basically he's looking for a coffee replacement. Cause he was saying like, it just blocks the part of your brain that thinks you're tired. It doesn't actually give you the energy that you're searching such oh, as I guess like, like, a like B vitamins, B vitamins are really good. For, yep. for energy, things like that, yep. which, yep. um, I don't know. I, I, I like coffee though. 
I do too. I, I you know, I, I know some guys do the um, like the bulletproof coffee with like the MCT oils and things like that. And I'm fine with black coffee, man. You know that. Yeah, I've recently they, started uh, putting like this little mushroom supplement. Oh, interesting. In, in my coffee, um, someone that I know is a uh, artist up in DC, and she takes it, and it's like a supplement to help you focus. Other than like, you know, some people go out there in the world and just pop an Adderall to right, stay exactly. focused, which is uh, not the best way to do things. Agreed. Agreed. The more natural, the better. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. yeah. If I find it, I'll send it to you and you can check Please. it out. Um, but other than that, it seems like you got a lot to be proud of. You got sons. You're successful. Is there any sort of message you want to share with the world before I let you roll here? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm older than than a lot. I, I never thought I'd be, you know, I, I always thought like 45 would be really old, but it, it seems like yesterday I was I was 22 years old trying to figure it all out, right? And so, you know, one, I think it goes by really fast. And I think I'm a huge proponent of lifelong learning. You know, I read a ton of books. I'm always watching podcasts and YouTube videos, just trying to pick up one thing, you know, trying to, trying to get 1% better every single day. And, you know, if you can do that, man, the sky's the limit. I don't care where you start. If you continue that upward climb and, and build upon victories, there's no cap. There really isn't. No cap. That's what the kids are saying now, nowadays. I, so I, was I like, didn't no realize cap. I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Happy to have Jeff on. Thanks for everyone listening. We'll see you all next week. Bye, guys.